Amen. I, I love the presence of the Lord. I'll tell you what, I used to think that some of the worldly things out there gave you good pleasure, but you let the, let, let the presence of God get a hold of you, and there's nothing compares to that. And the reason nothing compares to that is it's not of this world. It's not of this world. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 19. As you know, today is Palm Sunday. Amen. And we are excited. We are excited that it is Palm Sunday. Because we want to reflect back a little bit on what happened 2,000 years ago on Palm Sunday. But we also want to look at... Uh, that would be a story half told if we didn't finish up with what uh, Palm Sunday represented and what it's uh, leading into. So I want to start off with this right here, a little story. There's a little story about a little boy, and he was sick on Palm Sunday. And he had to stay home with his mother. He couldn't go to church. Later, his father come home from church that day, and he noticed that his dad had a palm branch in his hand. And he said, Dad, what are you doing with that palm branch in your hand? And the dad said, Son, you see, when Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, everyone waved these palm branches, and they threw clothes down as he was coming in as a big celebration, and we all got palm branches today. And the little boy said, Oh, man, the one Sunday that I miss church and Jesus shows up. And uh, the reason I kind of brought that up, because as you know, today is Palm Sunday, and this is a day where 2,000 years ago, the whole city threw a parade for Jesus. They threw a big celebration for the one coming in, riding on a donkey, as Pastor Roy said, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And as he rode into that city that day, people waved those palm branches, and they shouted, Hallelujah! They shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. They threw clothes down in anticipation of his soon coming. Amen. And this is where we get the phrase, the word Palm Sunday. This is where it comes from. It is a day that is time marked, a celebration of Jesus where he was worshipped and praised as he came into the city. But also this day is bittersweet. This day is also bittersweet for us because we know that as a celebration is taking place, in just a few short days, amen, on that Friday is coming. A Friday is coming, a day that we know is a day of ridicule, a day of torture, a day of pain, a day of the beating. It's coming, and yes, the cross is also coming. We know that these, some of these same people that are worshiping and praising Jesus as he rode in, these same people, some of them, no doubt, will be a part of his crucifixion. They will be part of his exchanging words of praise to words of death. From shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to the king in the highest, to crucify him, crucify him. This morning, I want to share with you a little bit. I want to have a little focus on an attention on two services. Two services in which Jesus was included in both of them, but yet with two different results. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. Amen. And it came to pass when he, Jesus, was come nigh unto Beth, Bethage and to Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against us, in the which you, at your entering, you will find a colt tied, whereunto yet never a man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. Verse 31, And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them, and as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, 
they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come at nigh, even at now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It is said at this time right here that there's over a million people that would gather there for Passover. Over a million would come into the cities uh, within a 25-mile radius. That's a lot of people coming in there. One more passage of Scripture in Matthew. Matthew chapter 27, verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Who art thou, king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearst thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered to him, Never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast of the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner named, called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they delivered him. When he was that set down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto him, Whither of the twain will you that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? They say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. The title of the message this morning is From Praise to Persecution. From Praise to Persecution, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for the anointing of the word of the Lord. God, this is an exciting time for us this year because we know this is the reason we have hope here today. This is the reason we can stand in freedom in this house and praise you and worship you because we have been set free. And you said in your word, Lord, that whoever you set free is free indeed. And I thank you for that, Lord. But Lord, I just pray today for the word, the word of God, that, that we will get something out of this and know really where we stand with you. That, Lord, we won't have a casual faith, but we will have a committed faith. One that will stand no matter what comes against us. Lord, I know that there was two different services right here that you attended. One was with praise and one was with persecution. But I just pray, Lord, that we, we today can honor you for what you did for us 2,000 years ago. I pray in advance, Lord, for what you're going to do to the ones that are listening today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. One thing that I do know, amen. Billy Graham said this one time. He said, the greatest mission field of our country today is in the local church, the people that are sitting on the pews. That's a Billy Graham statement. But one thing that I know is for sure is this. Many people know what to say. Many people even know how to say it. There's even people that know how to look it and how to act it. Amen. But when the rubber really truly meets the road, if there's no personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and there's no salvation in your soul, amen, then it only produces empty words with no action at all. Can I hear an amen to that? We see a perfect example of this in the two passages that we just read. On Sunday, Jesus rode into a city with people shouting praises, Shouting glory to God for all the wonderful works that he had done. That's a key statement right there. That's a key statement right there of they shouted for all the wonderful works he had done. Amen. Keep that in the back of your mind just for a moment. And five days later, on Friday, we see the, they're shouting, Give us Barabbas. We want him. And to Jesus, they're saying, Let him be crucified. 
Put him to death. Let him be crucified. Amen. You see, they probably had many reasons why. What happened? What happened? I mean, why the change? Why in five days such a change from praise to persecution? you got to kind of think about that for a minute. I mean, I, I, I'm a realist, you know that. And I, when I read these things, I think, Lord, what happened in the five days? Because no doubt some of these people that were praising you as you come in the city contributed to the Barabbas, Barabbas, and crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus. What happened? Well, there's probably many reasons why this happened. But I think that uh, the main reason was their words didn't match their hearts. Their words didn't match really what was truly in their hearts. You see, they possess what you call a casual faith. A lot of people possess a casual faith. They didn't have a committed faith. A committed faith. Amen. You see, they had religion, but they didn't have a relationship. God hates religion. It's a form without power. I've had people back when I first come to the Lord out there to plant, they say, hey, I heard you got religion. I go, no, I didn't get religion. They go, didn't you accept Jesus? I said, yeah, I got Jesus. I didn't get religion. Amen. I got a relationship because religion is what condemned the scribes and Pharisees. They were religious people. They were in religion. They were on the corners praying where everybody could see them, where they could be look, lifted up. Amen. That's what Jesus hates. He said they've got a lot of dead men bones and words coming out of them because their, their hearts don't match what they really possess. They had a casual faith, but not a committed faith. So we come to this question this morning between us here. How can we, how can I, how can you have a committed faith? How can we have a faith that Jesus is proud of? How can we be for real and sincere? How can we be consistent in everything we say and everything we do and everything we think? Amen. Well, I want to share with you real quickly here three keys this morning that will help us obtain the type of faith that Jesus is looking for in each of us. Key number one is this. A committed faith is not self-centered, but it's Christ-centered. A committed faith is not about us. It's about Him. Amen. Amen. Think about it for a minute, folks. Listen to me. It sounds obvious, but so many times people miss this. We have a tendency to say to God, Lord, here's my calendar. Lord, here's my agenda. Here's my schedule. And I hope maybe somewhere down this week I can fit you somewhere in it. I mean, we do that. It's a casual faith. People come to church on Sunday. They praise the Lord. They give their best to Jesus on Sunday. But through the week, they put him on a shelf somewhere, and they only get him off the shelf if they need him. Oh, if I need you, Lord, I know where to find you. You're on the shelf back there. Can I tell you something right now? Can I say it loud and clear that our God we serve, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is not going to be put in a box? He's not going to be put in a box somewhere that you use as an insurance policy somewhere. He wants to be in every aspect of your life. Amen. You might think something like, uh, uh, Lord, when it's convenient, I'll, I'll use you. I'll use you, Lord. Well, on this Palm Sunday, and we read this scriptures here, we just, we just went over right here. As Jesus passed by, they praised him. They praised him for one of two reasons. You can read it again. One of two reasons. Number one reason was, the scripture says in verse 37 of Luke 19, because of his works that he did. Oh, isn't that the same one that opened the blind eyes? Isn't that that same Jesus that we heard about that raised the dead? Isn't that that same Jesus that cast out demons? And isn't that, that the same one that, that, that fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes? Oh, yeah, let's go see him. Many people are drawn to services where... God has moved in a situation. And they want to come. And they go, let's go to that revival because God's moving there. But yet they don't ever go to anything else of the Lord. They just want to go to see if God's going to perform any other thing in, in, in somebody's life. These are what these people were. They were there because of the many works and miracles he had done. And all the things they had seen him done. 
They praised him. And they praised him mainly because he was serving them. He was serving them by what they could get out of it. And folks, it's unfortunate. And it's sad. But there's more takers in this world than givers. And it even happens in the church sometimes. I hate to say that. We ought to be... We ought to be the most serving type people there is on the face of the earth as the children of God. But so many times people come to a church or they come into a, to a fellowship and they are to, wanting to be served instead of to serve. There's more takers than givers. Amen. Jesus experienced this. Another reason was probably why they praised him that day on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago is because they saw Jesus in a way to be politically delivered from the Romans. You see, they wanted to be set free from Rome. Just like Israel got set free in Egypt. They were looking at a political side of it. Their praise was driven by an attitude of what Jesus could do for them. And I hope you're not like that here today. I hope you haven't come here today to, just to see what Jesus would do for you. But I hope you've come here today to see what you could do for Jesus. To just see what you can praise to him and the honor to him and to lift him up. I hope that's why you're here today. Amen. There's so many times that people, even in this story, are driven by me, 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 I, I, me, myself, and I. What can I get out of the deal? What are you going to do for me? Amen. Pride, pride has always been a self-centered sin. And if you've got pride today, folks, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Here's a little story a legend about an ancient village in Spain. And uh, the villagers heard that a king was coming to the city. First time in a thousand years that this king was going to show up. And they said, man, we've got to throw a celebration. This is important times. Excitement grew among the people. But the people there were very poor. They didn't have a lot of resources. They said, what can we do for this king that would honor him and bring respect to him? We have no money. We're not a rich town. We're not a rich village. And then they thought within themselves, oh, yes, one thing that we all do here, we all make wine. They all made wine. They made some of the best wine all around the region. And they said, that's what we could do. Everybody, you make your best wine. And then the day before the king arrives, in the main square, we're going to have a big barrel there and, and a vat. They're going to have a vat there. And you bring your best wine and you pour just a cup of so in it. And by the time everybody in the city throws a cup in there, it'll fill this whole barrel up, and we will honor this king, and he will be well pleased. <clears throat> so they did. Hundreds of people arrived the day before the king was to arrive, and they all brought their cup of their, quote, best wine. And they poured in this vat. Well, the king comes in the next day, and they say, Welcome, king. It's a blessing to have you here in our village. Thank you for showing up. We've got a treat for you. We've got a gift for you. Come here to the barrel. And they gave him a silver cup. And he dipped into the wine that the people had brought. And he drank a drink of it and goes, What is this? This is nothing but water. This is nothing but water. And he spit it out. And they said, What? What are you talking about nothing but water? What happened? You see, every villager there reasoned within themselves and said, I'll withhold my best wine and I'll substitute mine with just a cup of water because nobody else will know what I'm doing and all I got to do is just pour it in there and it'll dilute in there with that good wine and nobody will ever know what I did the sad thing about the whole thing is all the villagers thought the same thing and they all did the same thing and they all thinking the neighbor wouldn't know so I'll just go ahead and dilute mine with water or whatever and they all poured their cheap water into that instead of their good wine and it brought disgrace to the to the city it brought disgrace to the king that come there and you may be saying well pastor steve why are you bringing that up well this is palm sunday 2023 and we should choose to honor our great king and lord and savior jesus christ amen by giving him our very best not watered down worship not watered down praise not watered-down commitment, not watered-down dedication. And so many people, we're guilty of doing the same thing as these villagers. We come in and say, well, if the worship team would sing a good song, and that'll touch me, and I'll get a blessing out of it, who cares about everybody else? Who cares about everybody else? Folks, we ought to come into this house right here with our best praise, our best worship, 
our best honor to our king, not something that we water down and save the good stuff for us. Amen. I'm telling you the truth, folks. The Lord's really laid this on my heart. Amen. We need to come in with wholehearted service, not half-hearted. Do you know that you may fool me and I may fool you, but we're not fooling the Lord. He knows what's in our heart. He knows the attitudes we have when we come in here. And He knows if our worship is pure and sincere to, to Him or if we're just acting the role, if we're just looking the role, if we're just smiling the role, dressing the role, all that stuff. He knows exactly what is inside of us. So number one, folks, our key, first key to this is we need a committed faith, not a self-centered faith. We need a Christ-centered faith. Amen? Number two key is this. A committed faith is relationship-driven. It's relationship-driven. Many of these people that gathered that day to throw their coats on the ground and to wave the palm branches in the street and shout praises did it because it was the popular thing to do. What's going on down there in the city, folks? Hey, Jesus is coming. That one that, that performed all these works and miracles and mighty deeds, he's riding in on a do donkey here, and uh, he's, he, 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 he's popular. And let's go, let's go, let's go see what's going on. They did it because it was a popular thing to do. What happened actually, I guess you could use this word, it was kind of a trendy thing to do. A lot of people follow trendy things. Amen. I'm sure there was probably some there. There was probably some in that city that were sincere, that really respected the Lord and really, really wanted to honor Him for who He was. But a lot of them, it was just the thing to do, the popular thing to do. They were, it was a trendy thing. Amen. And, and have you ever done something because others did it? Have I, am I the only one that's ever kind of done something because somebody else, come on, let's go do it, and you just kind of follow along in it and everything? Amen. My mother used to always tell me, and I know yours did too, and most of you, uh, that when we got in trouble or did something, I said, well, Billy did it, or Billy said it was okay, and you know what I'm fixing to say. And my mother always used to say, if Billy jumps off a bridge, does that mean you're going to jump off the bridge and everything? And, you know, we've done things out of trendy and, and popular because at the time it was a popular thing to do. We're all guilty of kind of something like that. But uh, sometimes we could get in trouble doing that stuff too. Amen? Amen. Uh, later, a few days at Jesus' trial, these same people that had a trend to say, praise the Lord, Hosanna, they were shouting words of crucify him, and all of a sudden that become trendy. All of a sudden that become the popular thing to do was yell crucify him. Because can you imagine being in a crowd of people that's wanting to condemn Jesus to death and you standing up saying praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Hosanna in the highest? Well, that could be a dangerous thing for you at that time. So the trendy thing at that time to do was just go along with the crowd and say, yes, crucify him, crucify him. You see... That committed faith is relationship-driven. It isn't driven by circumstances or situations. Amen? Let me tell you this. Beware of following the crowd. Jesus gives us a wonderful example in that. He said, broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And only a few will find that. Folks, we're living in a world where it's wide and broad right now. And folks are going in, in, in waves that way, headed for destruction. But thank God that you're here today in that straight and narrow, trying to stay focused on the Lord because you know that's the way that's going to lead to eternal life. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It's okay to keep up with the news, but don't get addicted to the news. You hear me? It's okay to understand what's going on around you. But don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When I see the news and I see all the terrible things that happened last week at the school shooting and, and, and all the terrible things that's going on in this country, in this world right now, it tells me, here's what it tells me, it may tell you something different, but it tells me, Pastor Steve, Steve Malone, look up. Look up when you see these things because your redemption is drawing nigh. 
Jesus gave us illustrations and signs of the end time. And everybody might be, there might be people that are saying, well, Pastor Steve, they've said that from the beginning of time. Jesus even said that, that there will be many in that day, scoffers, and all them that will say, hasn't this always been like that? But folks, you've got to admit something. It's worse now than it's ever been. You've got to admit that. I know growing up as a child, i never seen a gun in school. Uh, yeah, let me rephrase it. I did see guns in school in the back of a pickup truck on the rack. I seen guns, and you know what happened? Not a one of those boys pulled that gun out of there and started shooting up kids. They get into fights, they fist fight out there in the parking lot. They didn't go and say, I'll, I'll show you and go get the gun out of the rack and shoot somebody. Well, this is a different world we live in right now. I never seen a gun in school. I never heard of people coming into a church and shooting a congregation down. This is the type world we're living in. The enemy is stepping up his game. He's trying to take out the believers. He's trying to come against Christians. And you need to know where you stand with your faith. You need to have a committed faith that no matter what happens, you're not going to deny the Lord and you're not going to quit serving him. If you're casual here today, you'll never stand in the last days. I'm going to just be honest with you. And that's not a threat. That's just I'm trying to wake you up. You need to be committed because a committed faith is relationship driven. Amen. In our own personal lives, committed faith comes only through a personal relationship with the, the king, with Jesus. That's the only way you can be committed. Amen. Where every day is fresh. Every moment is fresh. Everything is new. He directs our steps. Psalms 37 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. That means when we're in a relationship with Him and we're committed, that the footsteps we take are ordered of God. But when we don't have that relationship and we're casual, well, our footsteps are the ones doing the directing. And folks, you'll find out we get into trouble a lot of times when we take on things our own self. So in order to have a committed faith, we've got to develop and maintain. I like this because so many people, they, they start off committed to Jesus. They develop a, a relationship with Jesus, but they don't maintain it. What happens? Circumstances come in their life. Situations come. Pink slips. They get pink slips. Uh, uh, a, a wayward child goes off the edge and, and anything. All these things. And, and they don't maintain that personal relationship with Jesus. And I'm trying to share with you today of how we, you and I, can have a committed faith in the Lord and not a casual faith. So we've looked at key number one. A committed faith is not self-centered. It's not all about us, but it's about Him. It's all about Him. Key number two is this. A committed faith is relationship-driven, not circumstance and situation-driven. Folks, I'll tell you what. If you're going to walk, walk like that, you're going to be on a roller coaster. All the time if you're, if you're driven by circumstances and situations. And then key number three, the final key. Committed faith is not blocked by our personal trials. Everybody in this room is going to go through some storms. The yes. Bible says that it sun shines on the just and on the unjust. The Bible says it rains on the just and on the unjust. I mean, sometimes we are going to be collateral damage in situations sometimes. But a committed faith is not blocked by our personal trials. At the parade, it was trendy to offer praise. I mean, by the way, everybody's doing it. Let's do it. Come on, man. They're doing it. Let's do it. Peer pressure. Oh, no, don't get no peer pressure. Oh, come on, I'm with you. Everybody did it because of that. But at the trial, at the trial when they were yelling, crucify Jesus, it was a trendy thing to be a part of that. But it would be risky for those same people to stand up for Jesus at the trial and say, no, no, don't crucify him. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. Because that could be life-threatening. They could probably end their, lose their life there. Let me ask you this question. What if it comes down to where your life is at stake to either conform to a situation that in the world or the way the government's changing and coming against Christianity, either conform to our way or be killed. You better know where you stand on that. You better know where you stand on that, folks. I'm just telling you the truth. Because it's easy for us to stand here in a place right now where there's no threat coming through the doors right now and say, oh, yes, I'll stand for Jesus all the way. But what if someone come in 
and they put a gun to your head and said, you denounce Jesus or I'm going to blow you away. You better know where you stand. You better know where you stand. Jesus said, he that denies me, I will deny him. And folks, I pray that we all have enough Holy Ghost in us to where, when, if, where and if that happens one day, that we can stand and not let the trial come against our committed faith. Amen? Amen. Many of those, uh, many of us here, we, we, we like to praise the Lord when everything is going good. All is well. Money's in the bank. <laughs> everything is secure. Job is secure. Kids are acting right. Oh, it's easy to come in here and praise the Lord then. But can you come in here and give him the same praise, the same worship, when you don't have money in the bank? When foreclosures coming up on your house when your kids are running astray and acting a fool can you still praise him the same way are you driven by circumstances are you driven by uh, uh, situations amen but what about when the bottom falls out what do we do why here's what we do we're all guilty of it something happens in our life why God why why is this happening to me Lord you know I'm trying to live the best I can for you. Why is this happening to my family? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? Why, why, why? What did I ever do wrong? What did I ever do wrong? And there's going to be people out there that quit serving the Lord because of a situation. I've seen people quit serving the Lord. <laughs> I hate to say this. I really hate it, but I've seen it as a pastor. I've seen people quit serving the Lord because of something someone else did. It's the truth. Something someone else did. It wasn't even part of them, but they knew about it, and they quit serving the Lord over it. Folks, that's not a committed faith. That is a faith that's only driven by circumstances. Amen. Listen to me. Listen. Our faith, based on situations and circumstances, will never be committed. You'll always be on that ride. You'll be on that roller coaster, up and down, valley, mountain, valley, Mountain, valley, always. It'll always be casual, never committed. It's easy, it's easy to come in here today and praise the Lord with a house full of praisers, isn't it? I'll tell you what, I've seen people go to Christian concerts that wouldn't praise the Lord in their own church. I'm talking about in that manner. They'll go to a, they'll go to a Christian praise worship service at a big auditorium somewhere, two or three hundred man choir, all that, and they'll praise the Lord from the depths of their hearts. And then they come into their church and, Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, amen. What happened? You ought to be able to praise the Lord if there's two people in the house or 2,000. You should. Because you know what? It's easy to come in and worship and praise the Lord in a house full of praisers. But what about when you go home and you're all alone? What happens when you go home and you're not around the people of God and you feel lonely and you feel depressed and discouraged? Can you still, and life comes pounding down on you, can you still trust in Him? Can you still have something deep inside where I praise you, Lord? I know I don't like what's going on. I, I know I'm going through a situation, but God, you've been so good to me. Can we still do that? That's where I'm, that's where I'm trying to get us today. True committed faith takes the good, the bad, and the ugly with the same mindset. Paul said in Romans 5, he said, I glory in tribulation. And I'm thinking, Paul, <laughs> wait a minute. Paul, what's wrong with you? Glory in tribulation? How can you put that word glory and tribulation in the same sentence, Paul? He says because tribulation brings patience. Patience brings experience, and experience brings hope. And he says that the love of God is shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto him. Meaning this, when you go through a trial and tribulation, when you're committed to Jesus, it's not about the trial or the tribulation. It's about what Jesus is doing in you. Because I read in my scripture that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That nothing will separate us from the love of God. So even in your trial, he's there. Even in your bad deal, he's there. 
even when you, the, the world is storming down on your head, you can still have something to praise the Lord about. Amen. I'm just trying to tell you, folks, because if we're going to live for God, as a way this world is getting darker and darker, you need to be sold out to God in everything. Don't be living God just for the way you feel. By faith that we serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Stand firm through every trial. I'll end with this story here. There's a little girl, true story, little girl who was walking past a man's garden one day, and she looked over and she seen a beautiful flower, most beautiful flower she'd ever seen. And she went and she grabbed the flower I mean, looked at it and smelt of it, and boy, what a fragrance it had. She said, that is the most beautiful flower and smells so good, but why? Why is it planted in that awful-looking dirt? And so she said, a flower that pretty does not need to be in that type of dirt. She pulls the flower up by the roots, takes it over to a water hose, rinses all the nasty dirt off of it, and it wasn't but just a few minutes later, the flower began to wilt and die. It wasn't long before she seen it and said, what happened to my flower? It wilted and died. And then all of a sudden the gardener that had planted the flower, the one that she dug out of his garden, comes out of the house and said, what have you done? What have you done to my beautiful flower? You have ruined it. You have killed my finest flower. She said, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, but I didn't like the dirt it was planted in. It was awful looking dirt and a flower that pretty and with that type of fragrance needed to be in better dirt. And the gardener said, I chose that spot and I chose that type of dirt to put that flower in because I knew exactly where it would grow its best. Now folks, listen to me. And the Lord knows exactly where to plant you and where you'll grow your best. You hear me? Don't look at the situation and say, oh, the dirt's dirty or the place is not as good. Wherever God's planted you is where you'll become the finest flower. Just let the Lord do the growing and, and, and let Him do the planting and let Him do the growing. God has placed every one of us in this room where we need to be right now. So we've got to trust Him for that. God don't make mistakes. In trusting God, we're going to see that he'll use our trials, our pressures, our difficulties to bring us to a new degree in spiritual beauty. Amen. Even if we're planted in awful looking dirt. Amen. Think about it. True commitment comes when we accept everything God is doing and we thank him for it. We thank him for it. So this morning, is your faith in Jesus Christ casual? You don't like the dirt you're planted around? Or is it committed? Meaning I don't care if the dirt's got manure on it. It's going to help it grow better. How many know you add manure a lot of times to dirt and it makes plant grow better? Sometimes the, the dung, the stinky stuff, is what we need planted around us to help us prosper the best. Let Jesus be the one that is our gardener this morning. So this morning... Let's make sure we know where we stand with the Lord. This Palm Sunday, don't become like the people in Luke 19 that praised Him and praised Him and praised Him but never had a committed faith. They were just casual. Don't be like those ones in Matthew there that yelled, crucify Him because it was the trendy thing to do and everybody is doing it. Amen. A week coming up, five days here. Friday's coming, folks, a week where our past, present, and future sins are going to be nailed to the cross. All that you've done in the past that will never be brought up again, the mistakes you make now and even the mistakes you make in the future, he nailed them all to the cross. Amen. Amen. Doesn't Jesus deserve a second look? Doesn't he? Doesn't he deserve your best today? not watered down worship? Doesn't he deserve to be in total control of your life? Isn't he worth that? Isn't he worth your best? So this week, here's my challenge to you. I want you to give your all to him because after all, he gave his all to you. Amen.
before you turn your back on Jesus, take a look at his. Let's stand. You may be here today and you say, Pastor, I have to admit, I've been serving God all my life, but maybe I've just been one of those that's been kind of a casual believer. I know it's the right thing to do. I know it's the right time to come to church. I know that, you know, there's some conviction that comes upon me at Easter time that I really need to be there. Well, let me just say this. You're not here by accident today. It's not no accident you're here today. It's not no coincidence you're here today. The Lord knew who was going to be in the house today. And he knows exactly what you need today. So let's give him the best we've got because he gave us the best he has. If you need prayer today, I want to open up the altar. You need healing in your body. I can't think of a better physician than the Lord Jesus himself because he said in the word he is the master physician. Don't put all your trust on the doctor. Doctors are man. God made man. He can heal your body today of whatever you need physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is. The Lord can do that. If you are going through a situation and say, I just, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, the Bible tells me that the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. You know depression is a spirit of fear? It's discouragement, meaning you can't get released. You, can't, you, you don't have that freedom. When you walk through this sanctuary doors today, You've seen a big word that said freedom. Bishop Owen preached a wonderful message on when you come into the house of the Lord, there's freedom. Freedom to receive anything you need. Freedom to praise. Freedom to be healed. And it touched me so much that I I text Bishop and I told him, I said, Bishop, I'm ordering some vinyl letters that say freedom right above that door before we go in. And when people ask me, why have you got that word freedom? I can remind them that when they come into the sanctuary of the Lord, that there's freedom. There's freedom, folks. There's freedom to get whatever you need. Don't let the enemy keep you down anymore. You might have come in here and the enemy's been riding on your back all the way here saying, you ain't going to get what you need. You've been sick before and you'll be sick when you leave. That's a lie. The devil's a liar and he's the father of it. Give Jesus one more chance. After all. He did it all for you, folks. Every stripe that he took right there, as bloody as it is, and I love it like that because, folks, that's the way it was. That's exactly the way it was. That was for your healing. Each stripe he took on his back was for your healing. Whatever you need today, it's here at the altar. Come on in. Let's pray together in Jesus' name.